I was working with the European Union um, before the stupidity of the English took us out. So basically, before I was working with them, they'd adopted Kinevin as a framework for governance. I'm back there next year working on that in more detail. But we repurposed the project very quickly to write this when COVID hit. So this actually is really useful for people because it lays out complexity. And it talks about three things that you need to do to be a resilient organization. Now, I want to make a key difference between robustness and resilience here. So robustness is like a seawall or a riverbank. It's wonderfully robust. It's very efficient because I can actually farm on the landward side. And it's really useful until it breaks and then the result is catastrophic. Right? On the other hand, you know, we had a seawall break in the Gower Peninsula in South Wales recently. Well, recently in geo geographical time, not human time. And so they decided not to rebuild it. They let the land become a salt marsh. Salt marsh is a hugely rich ecological environment. It absorbs a huge amount of water. And even when it's saturated, it doesn't release it. And it survives by constantly shifting and changing. So a robust system doesn't change. A breach is catastrophic. A resilient system changes. Release is not catastrophic but it's inefficient compared with a robust system. So first thing you need to do is use your employees as a sensor network. Remember that picture I showed earlier? I've got every employee able to give me feedback within three minutes. So faced with a situation where I've got high ambiguity, I don't commission research. I use my networks to give me patterns. And a dominant pattern is evidence-based to proceed. This is what we're also now looking at citizens. I argued eight years ago, if we had every school child at the age of 16 as an ethnographer into their communities, we'd have a human sensor network, which, quote unquote, if we ever have a major pandemic, will be really useful because we can actually do lockdown progressively where people are ready to do it. We won't have to do a universal. We need to start to build these things at company level and society level now because we can't do the growth solutions we did during COVID, we're going to have to do something more sophisticated. You need to build informal networks. Remember that method I taught for software development? We put young employees together with people about to retire to go with somebody on the management development program. Yet what we're constantly doing is entangling people in different combinations, because if you entangle people, that's the way you share knowledge across silos. And you can measure this. So informal networks are actually the mycelium, the fungal roots that connect the tree roots. And that's really important. Because if you don't have a dense informal network, you've got a problem. Singapore government has got a really good one. Because everybody does national service in the army. So they all know each other because they've done two, a year or two years in the army. They've gone back for exercises. Their networks go across educational backgrounds. England has a really bad one because the elite all went to the same three schools and the same two universities, so it's a perverse network. Yeah. So that ability to network is key, and that should be a measure of health for any HR director, is how dense your informal networks, and that's easy to do. And the third one, this is called acceptation. Now, this is a key concept in innovation. So if you don't know it, all dinosaurs had feathers and they were very colorful. It's pretty evident they evolved principally for sexual display. Yeah, so you then get this small breed of dinosaur which starts to develop skin flaps under its forelimbs. So it adapts over time, and that allows it, like a peacock, to better display its feathers for sexual purposes. And it's a very small dinosaur, and it's more prey than it is predator. So it has to run very fast, and when it runs, it starts to glide. And that's how we get flight. Yeah? It couldn't happen in a linear way, because if dinosaurs jumped off cliffs in the hope of evolving feathers before they hit the ground, they probably wouldn't get a chance to breed. So what happened is a trait which evolved for one function in a linear way, under stress, exapts for something completely different. The scary one, by the way, for you is the cerebellum at the base of your brain, evolved in higher apes to manipulate muscles in fingers and then accepts in humans to manage grammar in language. The huge sophistication of grammar wasn't possible in a linear way. It's too big a step. So it requires this nonlinear repurposing. Most of your higher functions evolve for something completely different. 
the whole conditions for acceptation are something that you can manage. Because in a crisis, you need to rapidly repurpose things you're already good at for something completely new. And that means mapping what you know at the right level of granularity, and very few organizations do that. Constraints are key. Constraints are the only thing you can manage in a complex adaptive system. So we need to map the constraints and understand. One of the big things we're doing for companies at the moment is go back and map everything which happened during COVID, what worked, what didn't work, building that interest into what's called a sacred storybook, because we need to remember what happened in COVID, and narrative is a form on that, and then identifying ways forward. The big thing we're now doing, this is the sort of third framework um, within Kinevin, is estuarine mapping. Now, one of the reasons I came up with the idea of an estuary is certain friends of mine who should know better yeah, started to talk about constructional law where everything flows in one direction. And the whole problem with that is that reality is human systems are not subject to the second law of thermodynamics. So taking a thermodynamics model is a bad starting place, all right? Yeah, um, yeah open systems. And also, human beings work through abstractions. We can go backwards as well as forwards. So the point about an estuary, an estuary is not a delta. A delta is where the water flows into the ocean. In an estuary, the water comes back in up the river channel. So the water goes in and the water goes out. And you can do things at the turn of the tide that you can't do when the tide is flowing. There are granite cliffs you only have to survey every 20 years. There are sandbanks you have to check every day. So the metaphor of an estuary is a really good understanding of the sort of place we live in. And the way we're now working on that, and so I'll do this tomorrow, is we're basically building a grid, which is energy cost of change against time to change. We're mapping the constraints onto that. And then we're identifying what's called the counterfactual line, and that says everything this side of the line isn't going to change. So our space of operation is here. Now, so I'm going to go through this tomorrow. I'm more excited by this than I was about Knevin, because it doesn't say what do we want to be. It says what's the space in which we're playing, and how do we stabilize that system? Because the fundamental principle is whatever has the lowest energy gradient will win. If the energy cost of sin is lower than the energy cost of virtue, people will sin. In complexity, you change the environment so that good things are more likely to happen, and then you reinforce it. You don't decide what those things should be in advance because you can't know, and that's a real switch in the way that we think.